Okay. Hi, everyone. It is Devin and Courtney again with another episode of Eat Me and Question Everything. And today we are joined by Coach Bronson. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is going to be fun. Yes. So do you just want to hop right into it and give us a little bit about info about your journey, how you found keto, carnivore, and the lowdown on the keto? Curve? Yeah. Sure. So um, I've been doing, I've been a fitness health instructor coach for about 12 years. Um, and I used to own a CrossFit gym and it was during the time that I owned a CrossFit gym that I found carnivore. Um, my journey actually started several years before that and in, in understanding, being kind of slapped in the face and realizing that I wasn't in shape. I was not healthy. I was very overweight. Uh, I just, my, the, the perception I had of myself didn't actually match the reality of the life I was living. So that kind of kicked me off into multiple years of kind of self-discovery and journey. You know, we all know how that process is. You start at one point, you have that realization, I need to change. And then you kind of develop and it progresses over years. And this has been a 10, 12 year journey of just trying to find what works the best. And that's really what I like to focus the discussions that I have on is it's results. It's about uh, applying context to your life more than it is following any specific method or, or plan. Um, so I started Carnivore uh, 2018, May 1st, 2018. I went cold turkey from uh, mostly whole foods, paleo-based kind of a whole 30 nutrition lifestyles what I was following. And I looked at it, looked at Carnivore for three or four days after I'd heard about it. Uh, there wasn't much out there at the time. There was like one or two Facebook groups, maybe three. Um, there weren't many articles, definitely no books. Like there wasn't anything I could really find on what it was and how to do it. So I just kind of started by eating the meat that I had in my house and it's been four years. So it just kind of, it was a 30 day experiment to try a couple of things and see if I had any impact or benefit in, I was having IBS and urgent bowel issues at the time, um, my performance I had a lot of injuries and things that I was dealing with. My recovery from exercise was really bad. I couldn't work out nearly as much as I wanted to. So there was a handful of things in the quality of life that I was living that I didn't like that over the last four years have completely been alleviated by going carnivore. So um, that's kind of how things got started and how I got really passionate about understanding why being ketogenic and, carn and fat adapted and going carnivore and eating more protein and eating more red meat and not being worried about saturated fat and all these things I've been told were going to kill me actually made me healthier. So that's kind of where we are today. What was like, so I know for me, cause you, you said it, everyone has that point where they're like, crap, I probably need to change something. Something is yeah. not right. For me, I knew my moment was when I was like seven months postpartum and I weighed in at the doctor for my annual appointment and I was 30 pounds heavier than I was when I was nine months pregnant. And I was mm. like, okay, something is not going right. Um, Courtney, I don't know, wh when was your moment? Well, I've had millions of moments. I mean, I've been a yo-yo <laughs> dieter. I've done paleo, um, whole food, you know, like I've tried all that, but this time, yeah, just feeling like shit overall and waking up after a good night's sleep and feeling like lethargic, like I could go back to bed. Um, so that was like, okay, now I got to do something for my health, not because I'm fat, because I am, I need to lose weight, but I'm motivated by the health, not so much the weight loss. Cause I knew that would come along. So it seems like I know a lot of people do do this for weight loss, but I think the majority that I see is everybody doing it for like some sort of health issue that they had. So what was your coach Bronson? When was that like? I know you said you had a moment, but what was oh, yeah. that? Because I had, when I stepped on the scale and I was also there because my thyroid and I was, they increased my meds. And that was like the moment I was like, yeah, this is it. Like I got to lose weight. What was that aha moment? Yeah, it was, it was actually two major ones um, on, on, in the progress of the journey. The first one was I was at the beach with my family and my daughter, my oldest daughter took a picture of me sitting in a chair on the beach. And I saw that picture later that day and was like, hell no, there's no way I'm sitting there. I got my gut hanging out. I got man boobs. I'm like, <laughs> what? No, this is not at all. Cause you know, I was, you know, I played sports in high school. I was in the military when I was younger, all these things. I just pictured myself of being this 
vibrant, you know, athletic, physical person. And I thought, and, and I thought I could do those things. Um, but when I actually sat back and think about it now, like I didn't do those things anymore. Mm -hmm. That's, it was, it was living in the past. Um, so looking at that picture and being like, there's no, no, there's no way that's not the, that's not how I picture myself. It's not the image I want to present to the world. Um, and just all of those things. So for me, the process, my journey started purely aesthetically. I wasn't even thinking about the fact that I also was depressed. I also had no energy. I also had, you know, all of these other additional things that kind of went into living outside of my perception. Like I perceived myself this way, but my reality was this way. And whenever your perception of yourself and your, or your identity and your actions don't match, that's where unhappiness and depression and things happen because you're not living within the mindset you created for yourself. So realizing that stuff over time, but initially uh, it was just aesthetics. Like there's no, I don't want to look like this. So for me, it was really getting into fitness that I thought would fix the problem. So I started doing some things fitness wise. Eventually I found CrossFit, started doing CrossFit, loved CrossFit, got certified and trained as coach, as a coach, started coaching, eventually opened up my own gym. And then, you know, several years into owning my own gym, I'd gotten in shape and then I'd gotten out of shape as far as my, how my body looked. So I was more physically capable. I was stronger. I had more endurance, all of those things, but I still had, and I had gone through phases where I really locked in air quotes, locked in my diet, doing it the wrong way compared to how I know now, but locked in my diet and I got lean, but then I also got weaker. And then in order to get stronger, I had to get fatter because everything was tied to carbs and calories and eat more, eat less, eat more, eat less. And it just got to a point where, again, uh, me and water don't get along very well. I was at a pool party with some members of my gym and I saw a picture of myself again as the owner of a CrossFit gym. I'm getting ready to jump off the dive board and I'm like, oh my God, that guy looks exactly like the guy from eight years ago on the beach. But I own a CrossFit gym. I do CrossFit three days a week. How in the world can I still be this guy? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. I thought I was doing everything the way I needed to be doing it. I was eating less, working more, not eating processed food. Like I was doing everything I thought I needed to do. Getting all my vegetables in, taking all my multivitamins, doing all this stuff. Um, and it was shortly after that, that I was introduced to carnivore and then everything just kind of fell into place. So it was really for me, I think those two times, both of them being visually made aware that the person I thought I was isn't actually who I was. If that makes sense. For sure. Yeah, definitely. It's always, I, I mean, I relate to that. Like you're doing everything and feeling pretty good. And then when you see like a picture or something, you're like, oh, okay. That doesn't reflect like what I think of myself and my right. head at all. <laughs> well, and I think the great thing about carnivore, I mean, I used to do that too. I'd look in the mirror. I'd be like, oh, like, do I really look like that? And then the other day, you know, I've had this awesome transformation and I saw myself in a reflection at the mall. And I was like, I looked at my husband, I was like, wait, do I actually, do I actually look like that now? And he goes, yep. yes. And so <laughs> it takes your mind kind of like a little bit to catch up to that because you're so used sure. to catching glimpses of yourself in different, you know, a picture or a reflection. And you're like, oh shit, man, I don't like what I see because it just, you, you did that for years. So yeah. Yeah. now are you, do you still own your, a gym? Do you still? No, own I, so I sold it. I sold it right before COVID. So uh, towards the end of 2019, I sold the gym, and and that's when I started really getting into more of the virtual online stuff. So. Okay, so you have clients right now online virtually. Yeah. I do oh. one. I do one on one coaching. I do ten week challenges every quarter. Um, I have a, 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 a membership subscription base where people can sign up for uh, fitness pro different fitness programs and and have access to those on an online basis. Things like that. Now, are you practicing carnivore with them? Because I'd be interested to hear uh, your success well, stories or because yeah. I'm sure you got some good stories in there. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we got some great stories. Um, so I actually, so here's the deal. I I if you if I had to classify the way that I live, it would be carnivore because I just pretty much eat beef and eggs or meat and eggs, lamb actually more than beef, um, lamb and eggs. Uh, but I when I work with people, 
I, I do, I'm context based. So I don't coach a specific method or protocol. The, the protocol that I follow and my methodology is really based on helping people understand where they can start and then modifying based on what their body needs. So if they want to have, and because it's, it's not just about being zero carb or being zero veggies or whatever, it's about optimizing your body's function and everybody's level of what they're ready, willing, and able to do is different. Some people want to optimize as much as possible, as long as they don't have to give up muscle sprouts. And if that's what's going to keep them sustainable and they can do mostly animal meat and animal fats and get their Brussels sprouts in three times a week, then I'm perfectly fine working with somebody that way. Other people want to have this or that or do this. And what, it's a combination of what's the most optimal health-wise, but then also what's sustainable. And the place that everybody's at is different. So trying to force a specific methodology on people, I think is, um, I often equate it to going into a shoe store and trying to try on a pair of shoes before you know what your shoe size is. It just doesn't work. Okay. So I, I don't specifically work on any one thing. So what I do focus on is trying to help people get as nutrient dense as possible, get the most bioavailable food choices as they can, and then stay as satiated as possible with, with the food choices. So those three things together tend to be uh, more animal based, more animal fats, less veggies. Um, but I don't completely exclude them or force anybody to exclude them. Courtney. Oh, oh I didn't. No, know. I'm just, I'm soaking it all in. <laughs> no, I think that's, I was like, are you marinating on something? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's interesting. I think that's kind of cool in a way because I know, you know, a lot of people can be like very dogmatic about, you know, no going off like anything. Yeah, and I do agree. I think some things here and there are probably going to be fine. Um, what are your thoughts then on the whole, like, more animal based, like what Saladino is doing and having like a ton of fruit, like, would that be something you like the fruit and the honey and the maple syrup? Like, what are your thoughts on that as far as like having all that carbs and sugar along with the higher fat? Yeah. Um, again, it's an individual choice and it's, it's completely 100% based on what a person's goals are and how doing those things affects their health. There is no, there's no rule book. There's no police. There's nobody out there who's going to say this is the right way. To, the, the right way is the way that works for each person. So there are general principles, like I said, nutrient density, bioavailability, satiety. But in general, we want to optimize the way that our body uh, creates and processes and accesses fuel. We want to op optimize the things that our body can do to improve and have an uh, efficient metabolism. So that means we need protein for building muscle mass. We need to exercise to create a stimulus. We need to sleep. So there's a lot of things that go into it. And I think the context, this is a, a huge aspect that a lot of people miss. And that is the context of who's providing information, right? So Paul Saladino's context is different than Dr. Boss's. It's different than Dr. Barry's. It's different than mine. It's different than Dr. Baker's. It's different than Dr. Sida's. Where they're coming from is completely different. Who they're talking to is completely different. Saladino's demographic of his followers is completely different than Dr. Boss's, who's completely different than mine, who's completely different than who else. Like It's all different. And then the information itself is applied differently based on your individual context. Who are you? Where are you coming from? What are your goals? What's your experience? What are you dealing with? What is sustainable for you? What are your preferences? What are your likes? All those things. So there's multiple levels of context that need to be applied. And I think People start following somebody and just go, well, it's working for them. That's what I need to do without applying any of the other levels of does this make sense for me into the conversation? Yeah, yeah I agree. I think I'll, I, I'm sure you get some of this too. We get a lot of, well, you know, we both drink coffee. We've both given up coffee on an animal based mm -hmm. diet. Um, I feel no different on or off it. It's something I yeah. love. And people, oh, well, you know, coffee's a plant. Um, Courtney doesn't use a lot of seasonings. I use a moderate amount of seasonings and I get flack for that. Well, you use seasonings. So-and-so doesn't use seasoning. Yep. It's like, well, I've done no seasonings and I don't, it doesn't make a difference. And for me, 
it works. And if Cordy doesn't want to use seasonings, like it's like kind of like what works for you. And in my theory, yes. I'm sure Courtney is like, we're all on the same page with this is if it helps, if I use a little bit of taco seasoning three times a week, and that helps me stick to it. Oh a, my God. Oh my gosh. You know, I people <laughs> up in arms about that, but if it yeah. helps me maintain you know, this lifestyle Bingo. that has helped me optimize my health and it nourishes my body without any, you know, some people are, get really inflamed when they have seasonings. And if that, yeah. that would be something where you need to eliminate it, but I'm like, I, I've gone without eating seasonings and I feel no different. Exactly. It, it's okay to have it twice a week if you want, as long as it's not hurting your health. Um, so people get very, very, it's like, not everything is black and white, you know, um, Courtney eats a lot of dairy and that works for her. Someone who's lactose intolerant, that's not going to work for them. I'm in the middle. Sure. So I think it's like very, con it's, it's contextual. It's like what works for you isn't going to work for me. And what works for Courtney isn't going to work for, for you or, you know. Yeah. And the assumption that just because so-and-so is doing this is going to work for you is, is a grave mistake. It's one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is doing something someone else is doing without evaluating how it's affecting you. Because I guarantee you some aspect of what anybody is doing, some aspect of it is not going to be helping you. And you stressing over trying to be perfect and do the same thing as, as somebody else is holding you back. And I like what you guys said is you've tried this and it didn't work. You tried this and it did work. So that's what you decided to do or to not do. There's a, a huge aspect of self-experimentation that people are not engaging in. You have to try things and see if it works. Give it three, four, five, six weeks. Take something out. One of the biggest things that I, I see with people that start working with me and my challenge, my challenges specifically is because in my challenges, we have some specific guidelines of nutrition. I want to, I want people to cut out seed oils. I want people to cut out processed foods and I want people to cut out dairy as well as alcohol. So alcohol and dairy are the two things that people have the most resistance to. Mm -hmm. And when I say, look, I'm not telling you you have to stop forever. It's a 10 week challenge. Just cut it out for three or four of the first few weeks that you're doing this and see how you feel. It may or may not be holding you back. If you want to have one glass of wine a week and that's normally what you do, try not doing that for four weeks. One glass of wine and see if you see a difference. If you don't see a difference and you don't feel any change in your progress, in your health, in your energy, in your mind, anything, then go for it. Have a blast. You want to have your glass of wine, have your glass of wine. But if you see a difference, at least you've tried it. And now you have an option to make a decision and it's not something you're doing that you're not aware if it's hurting you or not. So we've got to start uh, engaging and normalizing self-experimentation with this. Yeah, I agree. And I like that too. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, as long as it's not going to like hurt you, but like when I started this, way, I started because we found Saladino. So I started, even though my husband went straight to strict carnivore and he's like, maybe you shouldn't do the fruit, but I'm like, I'm going to do the fruit, whatever is helping me like ease into it. And then after like four or five weeks, I noticed that it was like messing with my hunger cues. Like I could have eaten like thousands of calories of ribeye and then having that handful of blueberries would make me want more. And I was already like pretty low. I was paying attention, you know, I've no stranger to keto. So I was paying attention. Like I was probably around 50 grams of carbs. So it wasn't like I was hundreds and hundreds and that would mess with me after a few weeks. It was good in the beginning, but then I just wanted more. And then I'm have, I've had a crappy relationship with food. So having those triggers again would be like a slippery slope. So Absolutely. for me, not so much, um, with the fruit. And I know I should probably, I need to do a little stint without dairy. Cause when I started, I was very minimal on my dairy and I would, mm -hmm. um, mostly do just like raw cheese. And I can tell my skin's breaking out a little bit more lately. Cause I'm also upping my fat and all my fat is coming from dairy instead of like, I don't know. I, I've, Animal, like, I've had some like meat. air. Yeah. I've, well, I've had some like air fried fat to get extra and it's like, well, I'd rather have cheese. So I think it's definitely fun to experiment and play around and see what works because everybody's going to yeah. react differently to the different. Exactly. It, yeah. And the whole thing with the carbs and the food and the honey and all, okay. You know, we talked about do what works best for you and try to find something that's sustainable. But the other thing too, I just want everyone to understand from a biological perspective, there's no need for it. 
So the argument that you need to have fruits in order to maintain a carnivore diet and be healthy is completely logically counter, counter, it's contradictory to its own statements. Okay, so you can't say that carbs are non-essential, but then say in order to be healthy, you have to have some carbs. That, that just, it's two co contradictory statements that don't make sense. I get fueled about this. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Me like, too. I Me get too. really, um, I, I love the science behind keto, ketosis, mm -hmm. um, the evolution behind like a carnivore lifestyle. Um, it's like one of my favorite things to talk about. And so, yeah, I get We're going to be friends. Oh my gosh. I, I like, <laughs> I'm learning the science and I'm like, tell me more about the science. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're learning, but it's just like one of my favorite things because I just love people think I'm nuts because I'll be like, well, this is the science behind it. And I'll just go on and on and on. But like you said, there is actually, and I'm sure you are very, you're much more familiar with this. So correct me if I'm wrong for the people who are watching this carbohydrate glucose specifically, mm -hmm. there is a need for it in the body. There's a usage mm -hmm. for the brain specifically, but the difference is, is there's no need for intake through the diet. If yes, because of something called gluconeogenesis, which you know essentially is your body can take mostly it will use protein convert some protein into mm. or is, is it, it fat? Yeah. Is, is it, it? It's fat yeah so this okay. is a cool thing so when i was researching my book is something that i found out that totally like blew me away um if you look up the definition of gluconeogenesis it says the creation of glycogen from protein and other non-carbohydrate sources so you look into that further and then the more detailed definition of gluconeogenesis is the creation of, of glycogen from fatty acids, protein, and non-carbohydrate resources. So I'm like, wait a second, fatty acids? You can, wait, fatty acids can be turned into glycogen? Hold on a second. This is rocking my world. So digging into it, this is, this is one of the, I talk about, I have a whole chapter in my book that talks about this specific topic. And the idea that number one, we can't be ketogenic without gluconeogenesis is the first thing I want people to understand. The reason that carbs are not essential, like you just said, Devin, is because our body can make glycogen when it's needed, okay? Now, it doesn't do it based off of protein right off the bat. It's not assumed that it's always gonna be protein. If we're ketogenic, the process of ketogenesis breaks fatty acids down and creates ketones. Some of the byproduct of that process supplies gluconeogenesis with the tools, with other substances that it needs to create glycogen. So the more ketogenic we are, the better our ketogenic processes are. They supply gluconeogenesis, so the better our gluconeogenic processes are. So ketogenesis actually feeds gluconeogenesis, so it makes it better. So it replenishes and supplies glycogen better than it did before. When we eat carbs, what we're actually doing is we're suppressing gluconeogenesis and making it work plus. Right, because so we don't- being ketogenic, because we don't, we don't need to use it. Yeah. Right, so when we're ketogenic, we're actually making our body better at making glycogen. Okay, let me, that's a lot of big words. So let me come it down <laughs> and, uh, and clarify if I'm understanding, because yep. I get told a lot, especially on TikTok, like you need carbs, your brain needs carbs to function. And my understanding is like, okay, yes, yes, your body can burn carbs for energy and whatever it needs for the brain. And it's probably like an easier way to go about it. But if you're not eating carbs, then your body is doing the same thing with the fat. So having all that fat, it's burning fat and it's, and it's making whatever it needs for your brain. So it might be like, I guess carbs would be easier, but like fat would be ideal. Is that kind of right or am i off <laughs> so it's still it's still glycogen but it's 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 using fat and we can say and just yeah. to be a hundred percent accurate it's using fat and protein but it prioritizes fat if it's available so okay. gluconeogenesis is the process that supplies all all anything in your body that needs glycogen your body will use gluconeogenesis to create and supply okay when we eat carbs what we're doing is we're replacing a natural process by eating more than what our body needs. And then we don't have to work on the, the, in, the, the process that's built into our body doesn't have to do what it's, it's designed to do. Okay. 
Okay. So I also, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. The parts of our body that need glucose, isn't it like, is it 70% of your brain needs glucose or is it 30%? I, you know, yeah. So I don't even know if it's that anymore because I've been seeing some stuff recently saying that the brain actually functions better on ketones. Right. So there, the specifics about that, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biologist. Uh, definitely not medical in any, in any stretch of the imagination, but uh, my understanding is that there are some aspects of brain function uh, that need glycogen, but from what I'm gathering over the past year or so, it's not quite as much as originally we thought. That yeah, ketones can actually replace some of that function right. as well. And I think it's like red blood cells also need mm -hmm. glycogen. Um, they're like right. the only cell in the body, I think, that needs right. glycogen. Um, everything else can use fat as energy. And yeah, and then we get into activity and, and the, the fitness aspect and things that we're doing and the different metabolic pathways. And there is what we call glycolytic work, which is where when we're doing specific types of activity, our body focuses more on using glycogen for fuel. And um, what would that be? That's more like uh, CrossFit, high intensity interval training, things that are more like uh, high intensity, short burst work or medium length work. So, so not like sprinting or weightlifting, but you know, if I'm doing 30 seconds, a minute at a time, take a little break, do it again, take a little break, do it again, stuff like that. So a minute to two minutes of intense work at a time is, is what's considered more like work. Okay. So definitely like hit training, a lot, yeah. anything that would call Inter interval training, things yeah. like that. Okay. So, you know, um, a lot of, I love weightlifting. That's like my mm -hmm. love. That's like what I fell in love with when I started fitness. Um, a lot of, I, I've worked with a trainer. I'm going to, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be as polite as I can about this. I worked with a trainer and I had already lost a significant amount of weight when I started with the, I, I didn't, it, we didn't last long. Our relationship didn't last long. Yeah. Um, who was like, absolutely not get off of this ketogenic diet. This is, you are never going to see gains. You are never going to improve your physique. Um, I only um. want to. I went, well, I had already known that at this point, which is why the <laughs> ship didn't really last that long. Um, yeah. I only really want you eating four to six ounces of chicken breast per meal, like, you know, get, <sighs> get rid of the yolk and your, get your egg whites and that stuff, which I, I now is like a, you know, someone who's, I mean, we, as you get more and more into this, you realize like that is the complete opposite of what we should be doing. But how many times do you, how many times do you hear this from people who come to you in the fitness industry? Because I mean, there are people at my gym that I've developed relationships with that are shocked that I'm able to work out as hard and diligently on a essentially zero carb diet. So I'd sure. love to hear your like insider. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I started No Carb Athlete. So you can go to nocarbathlete.com. I have a blog that I've been keeping, although I haven't been keeping, I'm saying that as I realize I haven't been keeping up with it as much as <laughs> I should. But on my YouTube channel, I do do videos and I have a playlist called No Carb Athlete. Um, and it's it's specifically because of that. So when I actually started, I owned my CrossFit gym when I started Carnival. A few months into that, learning about how it works, seeing how crazy my performance it just shot through the roof. Um, and seeing how my recovery improved and how I could go, I went from three days training a week, feeling like crap to five or six days a week, feeling amazing. And I had had chronic injuries and was getting hurt all the time. That stuff all went like everything completely turned the 180 degrees with the opposite direction for the better. Mm -hmm. Um, so starting seeing all that and then starting to say to my members, Hey, this might be something you all want to take a look at and starting to run some informational Q and A's and doing, start talking about it more on my, you know, the social media within my, within my membership groups and uh, doing challenges and saying, look, let's do a, a, a 30 day challenge of just eat meat and see what happens and things like that. I had people quit my gym. I had people who were like, you are going to kill people. I can't work with you. You become a fanatic, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I just, I, whatever, like I, I had people leave my gym. People tell me, who it's crazy, the dynamic of, of the, the identity and the connection or the, the, how we latch onto ideals. And I had people who literally 30 days prior had written a five-star review, sent me a personal three, four, five paragraphs, 
you're the best coach I've ever had. You've changed my life, blah, 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 blah. To 30 days later, you're going to kill people. I can't stand you. I'm leaving. It's like, what? I don't understand. Just because I said, don't eat veggies. Like literally, like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's crazy. So the, and, and from the fitness industry, um, just to, to get a little bit more personal, you talk about within the fitness industry, how things go back and forth. Um, I got divorced in 2020 and my ex-wife was a registered, uh, like a licensed dietitian nutritionist. And this was one of the reasons why we split up me going carnival because we got, we were in the same space working with people, gym owners, helping people fix their lives, helping people fit, fix their nutrition. And we had completely different paradigms about how we were approaching it. And we couldn't talk about anytime. I, she had a master's in nutrition. She was an LDN, like all these things. And anytime, because I'm still learning at this point, I'd only been doing it for a year and a half, maybe two years. And, you know, I'm asking questions about things because the carnivore diet and the more I understood it, the more puzzle pieces of all the questions I had about health and everything and nutrition. Why do we do this? And how does this work? And, and the, when I started asking questions that she couldn't answer, things really got bad. Things really got bad. So that just led to the contention of things that were going on in a relationship between we ended up getting divorced. But that's, the divorce is neither here nor there. But the, the contention within the space, because people identify with certain things, is a very real thing. And that's why I try to be as um, non-dogmatic as possible in the way that I approach it. And that's why, you know, I use the phrase evidence-based, results-based, context-driven, those types of things, because I want to focus on what is the goal of the individual I'm working on and what's the best way to get them there. You know, I have one, I have some clients who, based on their situation, I'm telling them, you need to increase your fat, you need to increase your protein, you need to work out less, and you need to work out this way instead of that way. And then I have other clients in the same space who are saying, I'm saying, you don't need that much protein, you don't need that much fat, you need to work out more. It's completely different because everybody's coming from a different place. Yeah, I think, I think one of the, as someone who loves just fitness so much, I think the fitness industry has become one of the most dogmatic industries. Oh, and it, sure. is, like, it, it doesn't matter what you say. I mean, pretty much every personal trainer that I'm friends with or have worked with, there's been one that was very keto and she was keto for health reasons because she was a really mm -hmm. individual before, but it is, oh my God, no, you just need to eat a balanced diet you eat sure. this many carbs, this many macro, like in count your macros. And it's like, well, I, yeah, I did that. And I gained 35 pounds. It oh. didn't work. What am I doing <laughs> wrong? Well, you were right. eating too much. You're lying about it. like, and now people are accusing you of lying about it. And I'm like, no, I hear I've been tracking my calories for months and yep. I'm eating within my calorie deficit and it's not working. So I do think fitness, I mean, I know I drink elect, I drink salt for my electrolytes instead of, uh, like a lot of people at my gym, they do, um, the, the, uh, rice crispy bars as pre-workout or like, um, gummy bears as pre-workout. And I like, will just drink like a, a little bit of Redmond's real salt. And I'm like, yeah. right. It. And I'm just like, can you imagine if I told these people like, Hey, I just took a shot of, you know, some Himalayan sea salt before right. for my pre-workout they just yep. have a conniption about that you're gonna, and you're gonna crush it your recovery is gonna be better everything about your your performance would be way better if, than theirs yeah and if you had told me like today I was looking in the mirror and I'm finally seeing as a female for me this is crazy because I I never thought I'd see this the fibers in my chest like finally hey, there you go see ripples, it. And ripples never, going across. yeah and I like, <laughs> looked at my husband and I was like whoa. And he's like, yeah, like you've been pushing it, but it's so crazy because when I started eating this way, I'm lifting the heaviest I've ever lifted in my entire life. And I've been lifting for five years now. And not only that, I can do a crazy lift session and then go pump an hour out off on the Stairmaster. Now, when I was eating a ton of carbs, I could barely do five minutes on the Stairmaster. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. And I'm not saying you should go do an hour on the Stairmaster. Obviously, that's just, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sadistic and I like it. But I'm like, if you would have told me, you know, at the beginning of this year when I was doing this balance, 
this diet, eating all these carbohydrates, like, oh yeah, in a couple of months, you're going to be busting out an hour in the Stairmaster. I said, right. you're batshit crazy. You know what I right. mean? So yeah, it yeah. is just crazy how much it can transform your, like your health, but the performance in the gym, like I tell people, you're going to have like an adjustment period, but then you're going to get some, some mad gains because it's Absolutely. like, crazy. Yeah. And the whole idea of balance, I think it drives me crazy. It, it goes along with uh, the idea of, you know, having a specific protocol. I'm going to do PSMF. I'm going to do 80, 20. I'm going to do 70, 30. I'm going to do whatever it is. It's, it's that shoe store analogy again. It's taking something. And, and here's the other thing about that is balanced against what? There's no they, context. There's no, there's no, yeah, there's, there's so nothing. What there's they nothing. feel, their opinion. Right. Oh, right. So it's again, it's not about what's actually working for anybody. It's just you should have this much and this much and this much. That's a balance. Okay. Well, what if it's not enough? What if it's too much? Okay. Well, let's apply calories to it. Okay. Well, calories aren't really a thing either because they're just a number applied to some food that you're putting in that's not brain burned one for one because protein is burned less than carbs, less right. than fat. So uh, calories don't work either. But then in this space, this is something else I, I like to talk about is, you know, the whole idea of ratios and percentages of what makes you keto or what makes you carnivore or whatever. I want people to understand that that's based on calories. And there's no saying that the calorie number you're using is actually what you need. Number one, it could be more, it could be less. And if you're working on a sliding scale of every time I increase my protein, I have to lower my fat or every time I increase my fat, I have to lower my protein by definition you are getting less nutrition or you're getting more than one of the other than you need. So you're either getting more fat you need and less protein or more protein and less fat or more of both or less of both than your body needs. So I like to talk about them as being knobs and you can select the protein as you need and you can select the fat as you need. And if you have some carbs in there, you can play around with the carbs over here a little bit too. Keep that, try to keep that low. Don't go, don't, don't go too high on that but they're individual and they're not related to each other at all. But you're just talking about like going by how you feel then, or I mean, or tracking. Oh, no. no, tracking, absolutely. So, and and this is another, another. I love this. Tracking doesn't mean, doesn't have to mean. It, in my case, when I'm working with somebody, I want you to track um, everything that you put in your mouth, get your macros down, count your grams, all that kind of stuff. Because I want to use it as a learning experience because if you can't, if you don't track, you're not, if, if you're not tracking, you're not really trying, number one. Number two, if you don't track, you don't have any knowledge about what you're actually doing. So when you're not tracking, you don't have a reference to keep an eye on what you're doing. So tracking is a tool to help connect you visually and uh, somatically with the food that you're eating. If you know after six months of tracking what eating eight ounces of steak feels like in your body, what it looks like on the plate, those types of things, then eventually you're not going to need to track that steak anymore because you know this is what I have. And you have a better idea in general what you ate throughout the day because now you've got practice and you've connected it to the actual numbers. So do I think we need to track all the time? Absolutely not. Do I think we need to track when we're trying to make an adjustment? Absolutely. Because you can't change you can't change something if you don't know what you need to change. So I think tracking is a key tool that can be used at specific times. Doesn't happen ever. It doesn't have to happen all the time. On top of that, tracking doesn't mean always tracking every bite and every gram. Sometimes for people who want to be more intuitive, it can just mean keep an eye on the general, generally what you're eating. And I, I use the example of if you know you're eating three ribeyes a day and after three or four weeks of that, you realize, hey, I'm gaining body fat. I'm gaining, I'm getting chubbier. I get on a body composition scale. I do a measurement, whatever and I'm gaining body fat, maybe three ribeyes isn't what you should do. Maybe two ribeyes and some fish is a better way to go. So lower the fat intake. Keep the protein where it is, right? Because you don't need to do both. You can keep the protein in general where it is, just lower the fat intake a little bit and see if that makes a difference. Now I can eat two ribeyes and some fish every day. I still have the energy I need. I'm still crushing it in the gym. I can still recover well. I'm sleeping well. My hormones are working fine. And now I'm not gaining fat because that extra ribeye had more fat than my body needed for the day. So that's another way to track as well. So you're just keeping an eye on what you're eating, but at least it's something rather than just eating whatever you feel like eating. Doing anything based off of how you feel is often a mistake, particularly for people just getting started because 
they don't know what they feel. Many people don't know what actual hunger feels like. Many people don't know what actual satiety feels like. So I, I hesitate in most cases to tell people to eat to your whole because many people don't know what that is. Yeah, that's true, especially in the beginning. Um, I feel like this kind of ties in. So let me just ask, I get a lot of um, like DMs that are like, I, you know, I'm a few weeks in or I'm a few months in and I'm, and I'm gaining, like, what do I do? It's like, okay, first I'm not trying to be a coach. Like I'm sharing some recipes. Um, <laughs> so what, what do you think like the answer is just like to track then? Yeah, to track, but to track, not just your food, um, start tracking the actual metrics about your life. There are a ton of things to track. I think I have a video on my YouTube that's like all the things you can track besides your weight when it comes to your progress. Because, it, uh, we're, okay, we're going to run down a list. You guys would be like, holy crap, never thought about this. You can track your weight, one metric, okay? If we talk about body composition, now we get a body composition scanner. I, I like in-body body comp scans. They have at-home devices. You can get anything off the internet, whatever. But you've got your, your body fat mass, your body fat percentage, your lean muscle mass, your skeletal muscle mass, your BMR, okay? You've got your skeletal muscle mass percentage, so there's six. You've also got all the performance things when it comes to fitness. You've got strength, power, speed, endurance, flexibility, agility, uh, there's uh, your stamina, there's a bunch of things on the fitness side of things. Then you've got how does your body move? How well can you squat? Can you push? Can you lunge? Can you pull things? Can you carry things? Can you twist your body? Can you sit up, right? You've got how well does your body perform in physical activity? How well can your body process ATP for strength movements? How well can your body process glycogen for glycolytic work? How well does your body burn fat for cardio and long endurance work? So just all those things together, we're talking about 27, almost 30 different things that you can, do. and that's not even talking about when we get into the medical side, where we talk about blood work and all the markers there, right? I mean, we're talking 30, 40, 50 different aspects of our bodies and how our body works that we can gauge our progress. So when someone says I'm eating more protein or I'm eating more meat and I'm gaining weight, that doesn't tell us anything because chances are, and here's what happens a lot of times, they're gaining muscle because they've been under eating protein. So their body is starting to build muscle that they never had before. So they're going to get heavier. They may not have started to lose fat yet. Right. If they start working out and building more muscle and using their body more, maybe the fat comes down, maybe their weight goes down, maybe their weight stabilizes, but their body changed shape. So there's a lot of aspects to go into what the changes, what changes are happening in our body and how we can track it. And weight is one of like 50. Yeah. That's there's true. so many different ways. Yeah. Cause I actually had like a month stall, um, on the scale and my husband's like, well, look at all the things. Cause our scale, I don't, I don't know if you think how accurate they are. It does like all the percentages you just rattled yep. off. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And I never looked. It's so stupid. Like for all I know, I could be losing body fat and then the protein, you know, like gaining muscle. Any and muscle why, yeah. yeah. There's just so many factors that, that are involved. So yeah, that's a good point. It's one of the things, it's one of the things. So, and this is something I can send you guys a link. We did a study earlier in May. Uh, we got a case uh, case study published last month. Uh, we did an eight-week study with women over 45 who were peri- and postmenopausal. They did eight weeks of ketogenic diet following the basics of where I start people at um, and then doing my functional fitness training program for eight weeks. And we saw body fat loss, muscle mass gain, and all the factors that went into their physical performance. They got stronger. They got faster. They had more endurance. They had better flexibility. They improved the technical skills of the exercises they were doing so their body could move better. Um, everything there. And then I wasn't able to put it in the case study, but I have it in another white paper where we talk about all the different aspects of quality of life. Their sleep was better. They, the symptoms of menopause, their hot flashes and all the other things went away. Uh, there's so many other aspects to the quality of life thing that we're talking about that aren't even the physical stuff. So if you're talking about, you know, how do I feel about myself? How do I look in the mirror? Are my clothes getting too big? Do I uh, have more energy in the day? Is my brain fog gone? All these other aspects. So regardless of if none of the other things seem to be improving, is your life actually improving? If it is, then keep doing what you're doing. Because that's really the end result of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Weight means nothing. I think one of the, the, we talked to another, um, another guest. Um, I don't know if you know, Tyler, Tyler Fullerton, he's got a big following on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, 
he, you know, always rec recommends a calorie goal. And I think calorie counting can be really beneficial because most people have been severely under eating yep. who are trying to lose weight. So I think that that's a really good point that calorie counting isn't necessarily about the calories. It mm -hmm. can be about so much more as well, because, you know, diet culture is very real and under eating is, I mean, when I had, when I hired that trainer, she put me on 1200 calories. I have two kids. I'm a stay at home mom. I have two toddlers. Yeah. I'm on my feet all day. And I work out for two hours a day on top of that 1200 yeah. calories. I probably eat between 2000 and 2200 a day because I am up at 5. AM and I do not sit down all day. You know what I mean? So yeah. that for me would have been severely under eating. Oh, you would have gotten so sick. Yeah. So and this is the, this is the, this is the, the whole idea, the whole concept of context and doing what works for your body and what works for your lifestyle. Um, I would prefer, let's, let's talk about counting calories and let's see if we can change that, that language and talk about providing what your body needs. Mm -hmm. So if we look at how much protein does your body need, how much fat does your body need? Let's, let's just say, keep it in the corner of space. We're not talking about carbs. Uh, then it doesn't, whatever the calories end up being is completely irrelevant. It has nothing to do with calories. So there's a couple of things in my programs that I work with people. We never talk about calories. We never talk about fat loss. There's two things we don't talk about. My programs are not about calories. My programs are about supplying your body with what it needs. And we're about building metabolic function and physical ability, which is about building things that your body can do, adding muscle, adding movement, things like that. So the fat loss happens because if you fix all the other stuff and you're going to lose fat, it's just kind of a secondary thing. I'm not worried about that because it's going to happen. It happens every single time. I'm never worried about fat loss. Um, but I like to look at calories and, and, and split them up into functional calories, calories that are used to actually make your body work and do things. And then fuel calories, which are calories that actually give your body the energy to do that work. So protein is functional, fat is fuel. And they're used for different things. So in most cases, I give people a protein number and that's a minimum. And then they can do whatever they want to on top of that. And then on the fuel side, I give them a, a, a fat number and they can do whatever they want at that number or below. Mm -hmm. So we never over, we never, we never over consume fat and we never under consume protein. Um, again, what the calories come out to be, what the ratio between the two of them, what the percentage of either of them are against each other. None of that matters because we find what works for the body and for the person's goal first. Okay. Now, yeah. Oh, I, one thing I loved, cause I, I love, I don't want to say it. Like, I love kind of like you, you have experience in this with your personal life. And I know Courtney and I rant about this all the time. I kind of love talking about how wrong the nutrition space is right now. What is your, like talking about calories and kind of going off of this. And I'm sure you have yeah. a certain feeling about this based on what you shared earlier. What is your feeling about just explain to, cause some people will still always be stuck on this. I get comments on my YouTube shorts all the time. All yeah. calories are the same. A calorie is a calorie. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Your body uses it the same, like just, yeah, just go off because I don't even know if there's anything to go off because it's so factually inaccurate. It's like, I, how do you even argue against someone who says that? It's like, we all say like, it's, it's not wild. Too, right. like, it's just it's like, like, it's yeah. It's like, it's like someone who's going to look at the sky and say, the sky is purple. Like you can't even argue with that person. Like what? <laughs> to well, say that a hundred calories of a donut has the same effect in your body as a hundred calories of a steak is so completely off base that I, I, I would not, I, I probably personally would not even spend time arguing with the person who said that. It's like, okay, no, that's what you want to think. Like, there's no good and there's no bad food. I, I feel like uh, that is a really, I, I almost feel like that is dangerous because I feel yes. like that gives permission for people to be like, oh, okay, well this like crumble cookie is good for me. Court. <laughs> like, I just like, feel like it totally gives like a segue to just be like, oh, well this body, this, this food is just, it's just food. Food is food. Yeah. And 
us in the, like in this space, especially we very much look at food in a very healing and medicinal way. I think sure. where, um, typical, um, traditionally trained people are just like, well, food is food. It's nothing. It's food is food, you know? Well, so here's the thing is the industry as a whole, and I've had arguments. I'm, I belong to some traditional fitness groups on Facebook and things like that, where I often say things that people don't like, um, the current, the current methodology mindset behind the industry right now is it's the client's responsibility to be healthy. It's not the food's fault. It's not the industry's fault. It's all about their willpower. So it takes the onus off of the food industry. It takes the onus off of the medical industry. It takes the onus off of the trainers and the nutritionists because they're telling you what to do. If you don't do it, it's your fault. Right. So instead of them doing what they can to enable you by utilizing proper physiology, proper biology, proper nutrition, and the responses that our bodies have to food, they're building an environment where no matter what you do, you will not be successful and you will always need them. So that's kind of, I think that's at the top level of kind of where this is coming from. It's, you know, they're going to tell you, you know, you just got to have willpower. Stick in there. You can do it. It's like, no, that's not how it works. If you're doing this right, uh, willpower should not ever really be a discussion because you can eat what your body needs and it will be satisfied and you will not have a craving. You will not want to eat something else because your body has been provided with the nutrition that it needs. Now, that's a separate discussion than the mind work and the, the individual development of breaking habits and self-perceptions and limiting beliefs and all those other things that really that's what real coaching is all about. It's not about the fitness and the nutrition. It's about the mind work. Uh, but when you get into that stuff, that's different. And that's helping people reframe and reconnect and re-educate themselves on what health and fitness is all about and what nutrition is all about. So that's like a deprogramming from what's been institutionalized. But the physiological and biological aspects of it, food should not require, your nutrition lifestyle should not require what because it's not about that. It's about nutrition and giving your body what it needs. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, and just coming from, I mean, what launched me into eating this way was getting, stopping what worked for me, which was tracking my macros on a low carb slash keto. I got caught up in the anti-diet bullshit and I intuitively ate my way to gaining 40 pounds in four months and no foods are off the table. It's like, well, maybe, maybe some should be, you know, like, <laughs> I'm also like a year and a half. Yeah. Like I'm also a year and a half sober and uh, I think it would be really offensive. Well, I don't get offended, but it would be really inappropriate if someone were to be like, well, just have a glass of wine in moderation. How dare you not have one? Like, ew, you're not yeah. balanced. Like to me, it's like the same thing. Like food can be a drug and an addiction thing just as much as alcohol and drugs. So that whole food thing chaps my ass with these nutritionists because I've had quite a few come for me on a very huge following public platform that I'm causing my kids eating disorders by eating this way that I've traded one eating disorder for another and they're just pushing the standard American diet it's like I'm yeah. sorry so I need to have cinnamon rolls every day to be balanced like right. ugh, this gets me fired ask them specifically yeah I mean totally up to you how much you would engage in that, but I'd, I'd love to hear what their health justifications for cinnamon rolls are. You know what I mean? Like, okay, what is it about these that makes it imperative that I included in, in my, in my kid's diet? I think it's a, a mental thing because then it's well, like causing like mental harm by having that restriction thing. So it's not so right. much the well, ingredients they want you to, I don't know. <laughs> well, and that's part of the problem, right? We can't be, we can't have fond memories or good memories of being a kid without candy and sweets. That's bull crap. It's not about the candy and sweets. It's about the learning and the experience and the people you're with and all those other things. Those are, those are the memories that you want to create. Number one, um, the, God, this is such a frustrating topic. <laughs> it really, it really is. Like, I've got like five things going on through my head right now that I want to, that I want to say. Um, yeah, there's just no, there's no, there is no case for restriction being bad if you're doing it to improve your life. Okay, think about this. And I want everyone listening to think about this. 
Why do we put fences around our house when we have kids? Why do we lock our door? Why do we do certain things to pre prevent access to and restriction from the things that we love? If we're trying to protect our bodies, yes, I'm going to restrict my, myself and keep things out of my, in my environment. That's how I get myself to where I wanna go. You can go anywhere in the country you want to go in a car, but you have to follow the rules of the road. That is restriction. Restriction enables freedom. If you don't restrict yourself, you are actually limiting yourself because you're going to do something harmful. It's gonna happen. And then you get hurt and then you get set back and then you get hurt and then you get set back. It's the same with exercise. If you don't restrict yourself from overworking, overtraining, going too heavy, trying to do something that you don't have the skill to do, then you're going to get hurt. That's the whole, growing up and learning how to live life is restriction. That's how we grow and how we learn and how we expand our capabilities. We need to be restricted so that, that we can then learn how to control what we're able to do and eventually expand into new areas. So, so the idea that restriction is bad is completely counterintuitive to how life actually works. Yeah, I think oh, that was so good. <laughs> I, all I see is that being like a, like a, a clip, shirt, like, like a clip. Like, <laughs> yeah, there, it is, there it is. Yeah, oh. we're cutting that out and repurposing. <laughs> You're going to be all over the place. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that um, I love that that mindset, though, like literally everything in life is a restriction. Like if you look at it that way, we just don't look at it that way because, you know, I think the freedom aspect is exactly like you take that if, out of life and apply it to just diet. When you restrict yourself from all these things that are super, super harmful, although they'll tell you, well, there's no data that suggests everything in moderation is not harmful. We, we know this. Come on. We, we know this. Deep down inside, you can feel. You, if it weren't bad for you, you wouldn't have to moderate, right? But when you cut these things out and you no longer have like these obsessive thoughts about them, that is the ultimate food freedom, like to go yes. through life without obsessively thinking about your food or how you're going to fit things into your macros. Like I couldn't ask for like a better segue to my health and being free minded about like, Oh, I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to eat this ground beef and I'm going to be super satiated. And I'm not going to think about food until whenever I'm hungry next. You yeah. know what I mean? Like how amazing to not have to pack a snack for the afternoon when I'm out with my kids, because I'm thinking about being starving all the time, you know? So yeah, you're, I love that with the, you know, life is restriction. It isn't through, it's only through restriction that you like really obtain some amount of freedom and mm -hmm. complete freedom. And it's the same with food. And I don't think that people who are so people who are so quick to judge like a carnivore keto lifestyle as like restriction, they haven't tried it because they're so closed off to the idea that they have no idea how liberating it is to literally just give no thought to what you're eating, except for, Hey, I need yeah. some calories to fuel, fuel my body. I got to get through a workout. I need to get through the day. So I got to eat a steak. And then you're like, you eat it and you're done and it's over with, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like to me, getting rid of being controlled by my location or proximity to a bathroom is freeing. I no longer have to worry about going to the bathroom six, seven, eight, nine times a day, just in case, so I can prepare or, or uh, preempt a potential urgent situation. Mm -hmm. you no, know, my life literally used to be get up in the morning, go to the bathroom. If I have to go to work, go to the bathroom before I get in the car. If I'm taking a trip, go to the bathroom before I go to the, get in the car. We get to the airport, go to the bathroom. We get on the plane, go to the bathroom, get off the plane, go to the bathroom. We get where we're going, go to the, like, just in case, Anywhere in the transit time of any of those events, I had an urge. I wanted to hit it before that would happen. So I, it, it took me three months of going carnival to realize that I didn't have to worry about that anymore. But when that was gone, the amount of stress and the amount of just anxiety around everything that I did all day long, every day was just so just like, oh my God, can't even, you can't even, it's so hard to describe. Like I lost 70 pounds total in my transformation. Um, but I feel like, and that's not a little amount, but I never felt super really restricted by my weight, just not happy with it. But the 
freedom that I got from not having the IBS and urgent bowel issues, I would equate that to what I've heard people talk about who have lost two, 300 pounds. Because it's just that level of everyday impact and stress and restriction and everything else. And it's, you're going to be restricted in one way or another. You have, a, you have a choice of controlling that restriction to help you get better or having that restriction put on you that you have no control of. Yeah, that's a good point that, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to like say, but yeah, the whole like food freedom and, and it doesn't make sense to people, but, it, but not obsessing over everything. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm fumbling with my words, but I'm trying to link it to what you were saying, but you don't have to worry about all those other issues you've had because you're, you're letting go. I'm, I'm not making any sense right now. It's well, making here, sense in my yeah, head. Let me help. Let me help you connect. Let me see if this helps you connect it. So I, nobody wants to lose weight just for the sake of losing weight. The reason nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, you know, I'd like to lose 50 pounds today. It's a, it's a thing, like you said, Courtney, it's a thing of millions of things or hundreds of things over days, months, years of their lives where they realize something in their life is limiting them. They are restricted in their ability to enjoy and experience life in the way that they vision for themselves or that they really want to. They feel like they're missing out on things. There's all this, they're depressed about whatever it may be. So there's things that are building up in their lives that are impacting their quality of life in a negative way. And they think if I lose the weight, all that will be fixed. Okay, so they've identified, whether they realize it or not, that they're living a life in restriction right now. But then making the switch to choosing their restriction to remove the negative ones is where people get stuck. Yes, okay. Because they're yes. not aware of the actual restrictions. They're thinking it's just fat loss. They're yeah. not connecting it yet. So that's where we work with trying to really get connected and dig deep into what your, motivating, your motivator is. What is your why? What is the emotional thing that's making you want to take this action and make this journey? Then you can start realizing that this issue is way bigger than me not eating pizza. Yeah, no, that's, I guess what I was trying to say is I'd rather restrict my food than be restricted in all these other aspects and how, exactly. thank you for helping me get there. Yep. You know, this is how it like affects your mental health. Like I was able to go off Zoloft yeah. after eating this way and now I'm reading Ooh. more. Yeah, I'm only like three weeks off. So I'm still slightly like crazy as if we're adjusting. <laughs> um, but I'm just reading more how like this probably you know, is linked to what you're eating and what's causing like inflammation in the brain. So, I mean, that's like a whole other rabbit hole to go down to, but yeah. I don't think people realize the effect that the ingredients have on you. Like the ones that say, oh, a hundred calories of Oreos is, you know, the same as chicken, whatever. It's like, well, no, you're not going to feel good eating that way. So if it's not going to make you feel good, imagine what it's doing to your brain even, or just in all other aspects. But that's never... It, and that, but that's never a conversation. It's never a conversation on that side of the, the aisle. It really isn't. It's never, oh, food. Yeah. Like it's totally, you're going to eat a bunch of junk food. Um, and it's not, ca it's calorie, you know, void essentially. And you're going to have a mental breakdown. Like no one is talking about the, the mental toll, right. that lack of nutrition. And, and I know a lot of them, a lot of, you know, typical standard run-of-the-mill nutritionists will say, well, yeah, it's nutrient. It has less nutrients. It's less nourishing, but like, what about the consequences of eating this less nourishing food? I mean, I saw a trainer on TikTok who was like popping these cheese at cracker. Like they make these like, cheese at thins now. And she's like, oh my God, these are so good. It's like, I can't just eat one. And I wanted to be like, wow, it's almost like they make you, them addictive in your <laughs> right. But you're like telling me, telling me that I need to eat them in moderation to be healthy, but you're here gobbling them up. Like sure. that is an addiction. Like yeah. that's like telling, we like use the analogy, like that's telling like a meth addict, like just, just a little bit, just like yeah. a little bit and yeah. you're going to feel it. It's going to feel there's good, a, but yeah, there's a, a huge, bit. yeah, there's a huge cognitive dissonance in the fitness industry from fitness professionals who make their money off of looking good and they think that that's all anybody else wants to do. And here's the, here's, this is, this is the danger of all of this stuff that I, that we really have to understand is that aesthetically, all of this stuff works. Calories in, calories out works. 
Mo everything in moderation works. If it fits your macros works. All of those things absolutely 100% can get you a fit pro body that you can take pictures and be on Instagram, okay? You will be obsessed with food. You will not have a healthy relationship with food. You will be relying on supplementation and you will be sick metabolically every single time. So if you want to look at being healthy and having a good quality of life, do things differently. That's what it's about. It's about living your life, not looking like you have one. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I, I, I try not to talk about the weight aspect when I share content. I do sometimes because I know if that's what grabs somebody in to change their life is me talking about weight loss. If that's their only motivation, then great. Yeah. Um, but my thing has always been like, I've done this for my health benefits and the weight loss is just an added bonus because I know it's just going to happen on its own. Yeah. And people are always saying like, oh, just because you lost weight um, doesn't mean it's healthy. I'm like, yeah, I, I agree with you on that aspect, but what I'm doing is healthy and they just don't realize it. Or they'll be like, well, I'm losing weight, eating a bunch of carbs. I'm like, well, that's great, but I want to feel good too. Like, are you really like, thriving? <laughs> like, how is right. your stomach issue? You know, like it's not just about weight loss. Like you said, it's about just feeling the best that you can. Yeah. The, the whole process of improving your life shouldn't add stress to your life. So if I'm trying to get better and have a better quality of life and feel good and have energy and be happy with myself and happy with my body and happy with my food, then why am I going to choose a method that's going to make me obsess about food, feel hungry all the time, not have any energy and be a crappy person? That's how I always felt with like, if it fits your macros, that's always oh my God. Yeah. because I have, I have two kids. Courtney has two kids. You have two kids sitting there weighing oh. your, y'all oh, go, oh my gosh, God, <laughs> they're all grown now. So it's okay. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> but I felt like my kids were sitting down and eating lunch. I'm over here. The, the, the younger one is screaming, you know, wants me. And I'm over here, like measuring out my food, like in a cup and zeroing it out with the cup on it before. And I'm like, this yep. is stressing me out. Like, I don't, I can't do this. Whereas like you throw a ribeye on a, like, it's like you throw it on there. It's done and over with. Yep. So I just, I mentally could not handle that. If it fits your macros, it was too much counting. It was too stressful. And I don't care what anyone says, weighing your food like that takes up a significant amount of time if you're doing <laughs> things like it just does so sure. I, I think it should simplify your life and I yep. think for carnivore I know for me it's like oh I'll just eat like a pound of ground beef you know yeah that's it something simple it's great for lazy people I'm so lazy because I think <laughs> this way <laughs> but remember lazy just means you're super efficient right work, what is it work smarter <laughs> harder oh no work smarter not harder work yeah. smarter not harder yep Okay. Well, I, this has been amazing, but I want to talk about where people can find you after this is over. You have, yeah. you know, your book, you have some trips coming up. I know you've got some groups. So <laughs> can you tell us, oh, you also have a new podcast with someone else we love to talk. Oh to yeah. About. Yeah. So, okay. All, all the things are going on. So it, you, any, you guys could find me pretty much anything under ultimate ketogenic fitness. The title of my book is the ultimate ketogenic fitness book. It's on Amazon. You can get it. I uh, just actually this yesterday, we published it in Spanish as well. So there's a Spanish version out there too. If you know anybody that speaks Spanish that wants it. Um, my website is ultimate ketogenic fitness.com. I have a private, uh, uh, an open public Facebook group called ultimate ketogenic fitness. And uh, my YouTube channel is also ultimate ketogenic fitness. So all of the UKF stuff. Um, things we have going on. I do challenges. I do coaching. Uh, like you said, uh, coach Natalie and I just started a podcast. If you guys don't know coach Natalie, um, she's a wonderful, fantastic person who you guys have on or have had by the time this airs, she'll have already been yes. published, right? Yeah. Put out. Okay. Yeah. So she was on before me. So go listen to that podcast. If you haven't <laughs> listened to that podcast, um, she happens to live with me. She's in the other room right now. Um, and, uh, we're doing a couple's retreat in Destin, Florida in the middle of November, which is good. We got three spots left for that. Uh, we've got some other events. If anybody's on the East coast, we have a meetup happening on the Eastern shore of Maryland. That's going to be a real fun time. Um, and the podcast less love, more fist. We just came out with a podcast where 
getting ready to release our fourth episode. So we're just getting started with that. And hopefully that takes off and does some good stuff. We heard you guys like to rant at home and you decided to just turn it that's, into a podcast. That's pretty much what it is. We pretty much like kind of a little bit, of, you got you got a little taste of it today, just different topics that we hear or see. It's just like, Argh. so we just kind of talk about it and we we're like, you know what, we should just record this. Maybe, you know, what do coaches really talk about when no one is listening? Except now we know people are listening, so. <laughs> yeah, I need to check it out. It sounds right up my alley. When she was like, oh, it's just conversations we're having at home. We just decided to, to like record. I'm like, oh, like I relate to that so much because me and my husband have, you know, like thought provoking conversations a lot. So I'm like, yep. oh, this will be like, I feel like there'll be some comfort to listen to you. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like can't relate to that because my husband is the quiet one. I'm the talker. And so I'll be like, you won't believe this. And I'll just be going on. And he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like one ear so I like I Courtney is my my uh carnivore husband because there you go because my husband is just like I, I I know he won't say it but I know he doesn't care <laughs> <laughs> God bless him <laughs> all right well everything that you said will be linked down in the description box but thank okay. you so much for joining us this, this has been awesome. a blast we're gonna have, yeah. to have another rant again yeah, well, let's do it again and we can talk more on the fitness side, I think, because there's a ton of fitness things specifically I think people can be aware of that might help them in yes. that side of the house. Right. Yeah, we definitely have to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. See you guys. Thanks.